Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Brian Robson here, the Executive Clinical Director at Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Uh, apologies for the slight delay at the beginning of the call, and welcome to everyone that's joined us on this, the third in our series of QI Connect webinars. Uh, this series came from a request from our national clinical leads here in Healthcare Improvement Scotland to uh, connect frontline clinicians interested in quality improvement with uh, international leaders in the field of improvement. They ask that we make the sessions uh, short, accessible and recorded to allow access at a time that suited them. And we built this into our clinical engagement strategy. Uh, we called the series the QI Connect uh, series and we set about seeking an amazing faculty of world-class speakers from the field of healthcare, research, education, and other industries. Um, our initial focus for these webinars was the clinical uh, in, uh, community in the middle of uh, Healthcare Improvement Scotland. However, we now have an amazing reach, uh, wider than Healthcare Improvement Scotland, um, and out past uh, the uh, NHS in Scotland, past the UK, and now an amazing international faculty. Um, the international reach of this uh, has been supported by all the organisations that you can see on this slide. Uh, we're absolutely delighted with the partnership which is now uh, developed to create a global community around learning in these webinars. And you can see that more than 38 countries are now accessing the webinars, either uh, live or asynchronously and using the uh, presentations and discussion in their work uh, across the world, which we find is, is uh, absolutely amazing. We're particularly grateful today to be joined by uh, undergraduate students in uh, medicine, dentistry and nursing at the University of Dundee and the IHI Open School uh, chapter up in Dundee, so welcome to them and also to the uh, nursing classes in the University of the West of Scotland. We're absolutely delighted with the reach uh, to the undergraduate community and we're very grateful to you for joining us and look forward to your questions in due course. We're also absolutely delighted that the ISQA, the International Society for Quality, uh, has uh, uh, used the QI Connect series as an approved resource within their fellowship program which gives us reach to 20 or so uh, countries across the world. Um, just to remind everyone that we are recording the call, so we record the audio and the slides and we make them available to everyone after the call. Um, and also we're encouraging everyone to use uh, Twitter. Uh, we have experienced an amazing uh, global reach uh, through the use of uh, Twitter and social media, so please use the hashtag and uh, communicate widely internationally to all your pals and followers uh, around the, this series uh, and uh, this speaker today in particular. I'm, I'm delighted to be supported here in the uh, studio with a very small QI Connect team uh, with uh, Jennifer Graham, uh, with Lisa Birch and with Carmen Forrest. So this small team is, is uh, supporting this reach uh, across the world. Um, I'm also delighted to be joined here today by Sean Mayer. Sean is a Scottish Patient Safety Program Fellow uh, and also Improvement Advisor here at Healthcare Improvement Scotland on Person-Centred Care and the Person-Centred Care Collaborative. And Sean will be leading the questions uh, of our speaker uh, later on in the call today. We're also uh, delighted to be partnering with Coawatea uh, the innovation and improvement arm in Middlemore Hospital uh, in Counties Manukau in New Zealand. Uh, they are sleeping at the moment, but they're looking forward to uh, following up and listening to the recording, and they've been kind enough to send on some questions uh, in advance. And we're very pleased with, um, the, as I say, the reach of this uh, series. I was fortunate enough to meet with uh, Don Berwick a couple of weeks ago at the IHI BMJ Forum in Paris, and Don Berwick sent this uh, short message uh, for us uh, today. It's a rather noisy environment, as you would imagine he was surrounded by people, but Don wanted to pass a comment on the QI Connect series. Uh, so let's listen to what Don had to say. Hey Jennifer, 
Don Berwick. Congratulations on the webinar series. I must say, I wish I could be personally involved right now. My life doesn't love me, but there will come a time, and what I hear is fabulous. And enjoy Marshall Gans. He is amazing. So I hope you managed to hear that. Don Berwick saying that he was uh, amazing, uh, amazed with the reach of the QI Connect series and to listen carefully to our speaker, uh, who uh, Don Berwick uh, labelled as amazing. Um, now, I'm going to tell you more about that speaker just in a moment, but just before I do that, I'm going to pass you on to Lisa uh, here in the studio to tell you a little bit more about using uh, WebEx today. Hi, everyone. If I could just take just a few moments to briefly explain the screen that you're seeing at the moment. On the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see there's a chat box. If you want to speak with any of the presenters during the call or pose a question, just generally to have a conversation throughout the session, please select the name or select everyone from this uh, chat box and type your message and click Send. Um, you can also speak to the BT Event Manager in this way. If you have any technical difficulties, please select the Event Manager from this drop-down list and type your message, same what's wrong, and click Send. Okay, now just before we begin, if I could um, ask everyone to click on the wee blue arrow on the top left hand side of the screen. We're really keen to see where everyone's dialing in from today. Um, so if you could do that for me right now, that'd be great. And now if you could click on the location that you're dialing in from, yep, everyone's got it. <laughs> and apologies to those of us, uh, those countries that are dialing in out with uh, Europe, but the map simply is too small <laughs> to allow actually to see where everyone's calling from. Thank you very much for that, Lisa, and thanks. We've uh, totally populated the United Kingdom, I think, and we've got uh, Victor finding his way across uh, Europe. Uh, and thanks to Maria for joining us uh, from uh, Denmark. Uh, wonderful to see the, uh, the connections across the world. Now, we're just going to uh, slip for a moment uh, into music again, uh, Delu, while we uh, uh, load up our speakers uh, slides, and then I will introduce our speaker. So, Delu, if we could go back to music, and if people in the call could just uh, bear with us for a moment. Thank you. Uh, welcome back to the call, folks, and thank you very much for, uh, for sticking with us. I'm Brian Robson here again, the Executive Clinical Director at Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Marshall Gantz entered Harvard College in the fall of 1960, but a year before graduating, he left to volunteer in the Civil Rights Movement in Mississippi. In 1965, he joined Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers, and over the next 16 years, he became heavily involved in union, community, organizing, and movement. In the 1980s, he immersed himself in grassroots organizing and political electoral campaigns. And after a 28-year 20, gap, went back to Harvard to complete his undergraduate studies in history and government. His subsequent MPA from the Kennedy School of Government and PhD in sociology have not changed this man. And he is widely recognized as an individual who remains as passionate and engaged with the struggles of inequalities now as he did in his earlier years. Marshall studies and teaches on leadership, organization, and strategy in social movements and politics, and is a professor at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And it's from there that Marshall joins us today for this webinar. Welcome to the call, Marshall. Hi, thanks, Brian. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you very clearly. Uh, we are joined today, uh, Marshall, as you know, by um, literally hundreds of, uh, of listeners uh, who have been joining the Healthcare Improvement Scotland QI Connect series, and we're very interested to hear uh, of your uh, comments on organising leadership and action. And following your presentation, uh, we'll, we have organised uh, some uh, questions for you. So over to you, Marshall. Good. Thank you. Thanks so much. I'm sorry we had these technical glitches this morning that seem to uh, uh, get in our way a little bit, but uh, it's a privilege to uh, have this opportunity to speak with you because uh, 
uh, you've been called to a very special mission, which is the mission of uh, of healing. Uh, and um, the Protestant theologian Walter Brueggemann uh, wrote uh, that prophetic imagination, or what he calls uh, a transformational vision, that it takes to create change occurs at the intersection of two elements. One is criticality, which is a um, clear uh, view of the world's hurt, of its pain, and of its need. And hope, uh, the capacity to see the world's possibilities, uh, its promise. Uh, you're called to confront the world's pain daily in all that you do, uh, while at the same time uh, become ho sources of hope um, that lies beyond. And it's that kind of energy that uh, it will take uh, to take from the healing that you have always done into perhaps new kinds of healing uh, to uh, uh, take things in the direction that we would all like them to, to go. So thank you for that, uh, this opportunity. The approach I take to leadership is uh, rooted in three questions posed by a first century Jerusalem scholar, Rabbi Hillel. Um, and uh, in, the, in the Wisdom of the Fathers, Rabbi Hillel asks us to consider the following when we're considering what to do. Uh, the first question um, is to ask yourself, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? Uh, which is not a selfish question, but it is a self-regarding question, taking seriously our own values, resources, motivations, and capacities if we presume to lead. But secondly, he says to ask ourselves, if I am for myself alone, what am I? Uh, because to be a who and not a what is to recognize that we exist in relationship with others in the world and their capacity, our capacity to realize our objectives is inextricably wrapped up with their capacity to realize theirs. And finally, uh, he asks us to consider, if not now, when? Uh, meaning, which is not counsel to jump off a bridge, but it is an argument for action, suggesting that it's often only by acting that we can begin to learn what we need to learn in order to be able to act effectively. And uh, so for me, leadership is really about the interaction of those three elements uh, of the self, um, the other, the us, uh, and the now uh, that we're called, uh, that calls us to action. Um, the, the three questions, that, they, the fact that they're questions and not answers is also important because if you consider when leadership is required, when it's really needed, um, it's usually not when everything is working fine. Uh, everything's okay, all the routines are in place, all the problems are getting solved, everything's terrific. Is that when we need leadership? Uh, it, it's more when things are confusing and problematic and uh, we're presented with dilemmas and problems. In other words, leadership, the, the need for lead, leadership is essentially problem-driven which is very challenging because it's not when we know what to do that we require leadership, it's when we don't. And so that introduces us to the whole domain of uncertainty and the unexpected, which it turns out is the domain of leadership. And we ask ourselves, um, can, uh, do, do I have the skills I need to deal with this challenge? Um, uh, can, uh, uh, can I figure out how to, it's a challenge to the hands, can I figure out how to use my uh, resources in new ways uh, to achieve my purpose as a challenge to the heart, uh, and um, a challenge to the, to the head, rather? And where do I get the courage, um, the hope, the forbearance, uh, which is a challenge to the heart? So it, it turns out that leadership, a challenge to head, hands, and heart, is not so much uh, about having uh, all the answers as it is understanding the questions to ask, and it's much less about knowing than it is about learning. Um, and so, yeah, there we are, head, hands, and heart. Yeah, there's a nice, nice, nice picture. Um, and how the three interact with each other. So the definition uh, that I've come to use for leadership is, is this one. Um, that leadership is about accepting responsibility, which is a decision that we make, um, to uh, enable others, 
So this is not a diva theory of leadership, uh, where leader is the sun that illuminates all who draw near with his or her warmth. But it's a form of social interaction, engagement with others, to achieve purpose under conditions of uncertainty uh, as the defining condition. Not about control, but gaining, but engaging uncertainty purposefully. Um, and what this means is that leadership is less about uh, a position or person than a practice. Uh, we all know uh, of instances where people occupy positions of authority, uh, but turn out to exercise very poor leadership. Uh, as well, uh, often people with no formal authority who show leadership all the time in the way in which they engage with others in purposeful action. So, uh, so we find leadership in, in unexpected places um, uh, as well as where expected. So now organizing is a particular form of leadership that focuses on three questions. Um, the first question being, uh, who are my people? Um, what, in other words, not what is my issue, but who are my people? Who is my constituency? <clears throat> and that word constituency has a special meaning um, uh, to distinguish it from clients or customers. It's not like who are my customers, who I'm selling something to, who are my clients who depend on me for a service, but who are my constituents Actually, the word derives from the Latin constare, which means to stand together. Who are the people whom I'm engaging to enable to stand together with one another to decide what they need and to act on that? Um, and, uh, and second question is, uh, what is the challenge they face that requires change? Or what is the change that constitutes a challenge to them that requires action, purposeful action. And then thirdly, um, how can they uh, use their resources in new ways to create the capacity or the power to achieve that change or to achieve that purpose? So the relationship of people, power, and change. And what we learn then is that answering this question involves five practices. Um, and I'll return to these in a few moments. Uh, but uh, first of all is um, the question of, uh, of motivation, um, of uh, a shared set of values, a shared uh, set of motivations that can enable us to act, and that's what we call as the story work. Second are shared commitments through relationship building. And so the real skill or focus there is on relationship building. Uh, thirdly, is structuring those relationships in such a way that we can make decisions, coordinate, and act together. Hi, it's Brian Robson here from Healthcare Improvement Scotland again. Uh, Marshall, are you still with us? Ladies and gentlemen, please stay online. Mr. Marshall, line will be reconnected. So it's Brian Robson here again. We've just lost uh, Marshall's uh, audio for the moment. Uh, we're just trying to track that down. Um, and in the meantime, we'll give you some music. Thanks very much to Lou. that are fundamental to this practice of leadership as we understand it, leadership for change, uh, and was focusing on, again, to clarify what we're meaning by leadership in this context, that um, uh, it's not uh, this image uh, of the one leader, the one dot uh, that everything uh, comes to, um, nor, yeah, because that's what happens, um, 
And I don't know if you've been in that spot, but it turns out to be problematic both for the people in the Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, we lost Mr. Marshall, or we will reconnect him. Um, I hope folks are still there with me. Um, uh, we were just contrasting uh, the one dot idea of leadership to the leadership that goes in multiple directions because uh, uh, of our reaction to the one dot, which tends to lead in as many different directions as we might think. In a way, market organization is based on that, on each person and individual pursuing their own interests. Now, we think there's an alternative, which is in between the dot leadership and the, the dispersed leadership is a form of collaborative leadership. Uh, sometimes we call a snowflake, uh, which is based on leadership teams and distributed leadership. And that's the, the approach that we generally take uh, to this uh, work. And so that's what we're going to be exploring uh, with you. Also, the work that uh, we do of organizing, which is a work of change, tends to be done not in a linear fashion or in a programmatic fashion, but be very purpose-directed uh, in the form of a campaign. Stephen Jay Gould, the paleontologist, wrote that there are two ways to think of uh, time. Time as a, as a cycle, which he argues is the rhythm of continuity and stability uh, and predictability. Uh, and Time is an arrow, which he described as the rhythm of change, uh, episodic, moving from one condition to another. Uh, and that's the way in which we tend to organize activity when it has to do with change. What's our goal? When do we begin focusing on that goal? And how do we develop the capabilities we need to achieve the goal in the course of working toward it? Now, I just want to take a minute to uh, digress into uh, where, uh, where my understanding of this uh, came from. I grew up in Bakersfield, California, where my father was a rabbi, my mother a teacher, came to Harvard in 1960 uh, as an undergraduate. Uh, and, um, and while at Harvard, uh, got involved in the civil rights movement. Um, the civil rights movement was happening all around us, but we had also lived in Germany for three years after the Second World War when my father was a chaplain with the American Army, uh, and uh, a lot of his work was with Holocaust survivors, and as a child I met people who's, who had survived that horror and who were trying to find hope somewhere. My fifth birthday party was in a uh, what were called DP camps uh, of all children, where it was my mother's idea I should give gifts rather than get them. Uh, I guess that was part of my moral education but uh, paled compared to when I really came to understand why that camp was all children. Uh, the parents had all, been, had all been killed. So the Holocaust was a reality in our home, but my parents interpreted it to me not as being simply a consequence of anti-Semitism, but of racism, and that racism kills. Very simply, transfer people into objects and treat them as subordinate, and anything goes. Uh, the civil rights movement was challenging the institutional, institutionalized racism deep within the American within American history and and institutions, and so that was not too difficult. Uh, a pro, as a rabbi's son uh, too, as a rabbi's kid, I had to go to all the observations, um, which had its problems. But I loved the Passover Seder, which was the story of the exodus uh, of people from slavery to freedom and. And there's a point where they point to the children and say, you were slaves in Egypt. And I always wondered how that could be, because I'd never been to Egypt nor a slave. Um, I came to understand that what it meant was that that story was not the property of one people, time, or place, 
but in the fact is is told generation after generation, and you have to decide where you are with respect to it, uh, with respect to uh, Pharaoh and those guys with the horses or the people who were trying to move toward a land of promise for themselves. Uh, and finally, uh, and the civil rights movement spoke the language of the Exodus. It was clearly about the same thing. Uh, and finally, it was a movement of young people. Dr. King, when he began the bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama, was 25 years old. The people leading the sit-ins and the freedom rides, 18, 19, 20, these were my peers. And it was a challenge to explain why I could, why, wh how to, uh, how to avoid the responsibility uh, and actually the joyfulness of a kind of struggle and a challenge based on what we believed in, uh, very much in the spirit of Walter Brueggemann, who I mentioned at the beginning, of young people who come of age with a critical eye on the world they find and almost of necessity hopeful hearts. And, and that connection between generational change and social change was at the heart of my generation and our involvement. Uh, I left uh, uh, Harvard to volunteer for the Mississippi Summer Project, which weird to say it was exactly 50 years ago uh, when uh, we went to Mississippi to try to open up that state through voter registration and other campaigns to break down the barriers to segregation. And that's really where I got my introduction, my political education, uh, far more so than at Harvard with all due respect. Uh, I learned that when it came to the challenges of inequality, housing, health care, education, and the rest, it wasn't enough to observe what was going on and respond with charity, but you had to ask why it was going on and respond with justice. And the justice response is a much more challenging and deeper one because you have to ask the question, why? Why this inequality? And the why, the answer to the why, as we learned it, was uh, a simple five-letter word, uh, P-O-W-E-R, power. Uh, politically, African Americans had no political mechanisms of accountability. Uh, economically, uh, were excluded from all the labor legislation that protected uh, everyone except agricultural and domestic workers uh, in the 1930s. And culturally, I'd never had the experience of going up to someone twice my age who would stand up, offer me his chair, call me Mr., and not introduce him and introduce himself with his first name when, because he was black and I was white, and that went on thousands of times a day across the South. So combining the cultural, the political, and the economic powerlessness, it became pretty clear that there was a power problem. But understanding the power problem wasn't the same thing as solving it. And so some people went to Washington, D.C. and said, could you give us a little bit of your power to solve the problem? Well, that didn't go too well. Uh, it resulted in lots of testimony at hearings. What we discovered was that unless people with the problem also could become authors of the solution, the change was not going to happen. But they didn't have any power. Well, what we discovered was there was a difference between resources and power. And that, for example, in the seminal event that began the modern civil rights movement, which was the boycott of buses in Montgomery, Alabama, people discovered that if they used their feet, instead of using their feet to get on the bus and pay bus fare to the bus company, they used their feet to walk to work not as individuals, but collectively, it turned out that the bus company was more dependent on the people than the people on the bus company. In other words, resources could be turned into power through collective action based on identifying the points of interdependence in the system. And that bus boycott in which people learn that people have the resources, if combined, to turn into power was really what sparked the civil rights movement far more than any legislation or far more than any litigation. Well, that was a powerful lesson. And so then the question was how to make that happen, and it turned out that took skilled leadership. Um, Dr. King learned in the Baptist ministry. Rosa Parks, the person who sat down on the bus, was a trained organizer and activist. She was chair of the NAACP a chapter in Montgomery. Uh, another E.D. Nixon, another leader, had yearned, learned union organizing as a sleeping car porter. Uh, as part of that union. So the connection between developing leadership, building community around leadership, and building power from the resources of community uh, turned out to be a discovery for me about what was organizing and, and how you could effectively work with people to become agents of change rather than victims of it. 
Uh, I left the South after two years, went back to California where I grew up. Cesar Chavez had just started a grape strike of agricultural workers uh, uh, 30 miles from where I grew up. I had grown up in that world, hadn't seen it. I had to go to Mississippi and get educated about race, power, and politics in America or get what we called Mississippi eyes to go back home and see another community of people of color, also without political rights, Mexican immigrants for the most part, also economically dependent, and California had its own rich history of racial segregation going back to the turn of the century with the Chinese and the Japanese. So it turned out Mississippi was not an exception to America, but an example of the America we needed to change. I began working with Caesar, did that for the next 16 years up until 1981, which is really where I learned the craft of organizing. Did another 10 years of union issue and electoral work, mostly in California, and then was invited to my 25th reunion at Harvard, even though I hadn't graduated. Um, Harvard's pretty smart about waiting 25 years by the time which you should have both a child and earn some money. And the convergence gives you a great interest in coming back to Harvard. That wasn't so for me. Uh, but I was feeling stuck in, in, in my activism. And so I did come to that reunion. It was like running into a 20-year-old version of me who asked, how's it going? Uh, to which I responded, I'm feeling stuck. I need to go deeper. I need to go broader. So 20-year-old me said, well, why don't you come back and finish the senior year you never did? Uh, I went to talk to one of the deans the last day. If he'd laughed at me, I was so fragile it would have been the end of it, but he didn't. He turned out to be an Anglican priest. Uh, we talked for three hours. We discussed the fact tuition had changed a little bit in the intervening years. But I came back, and in 1991, finished my undergraduate degree in history and government, wrote a senior thesis, graduated class of 64-92, and my 81-year-old mother got to come and see her son finally become a college graduate. Having closed that particular loop, I found I had the bug, continued to the Kennedy School for a master's, and then a PhD in sociology, and I've been teaching then full-time at the Kennedy School since 2000, since completing my degree. The teaching for me has turned out to be sort of central to my learning because it's the place I've been able to integrate my life experience with social science in a conversation with a rising generation and actually following that generation back into the world of action, as in Howard Dean's campaign in 2003, the Obama campaign 2007, various efforts on climate change, immigration reform, and the rest. And so this approach to organizing that I'm about to share uh, is uh, developed uh, rooted in both the experience and the social science and the practice or the pedagogy, which I actually think is kind of at the heart of the matter. So let me quickly review these practices, uh, and then uh, we can have some opportunity to discuss them. The first is relationship building, and um, uh, that's what this little chart here is meant to illustrate, uh, which is how relationship building works. Now, I should say that these practices are not otherworldly. Um, uh, the thing about organizing skills are that they're practices everybody does for the most part, but we do them implicitly. And a lot of this work is bringing out what we do implicitly, making it explicit, so we can do it with intentionality and purpose and, and with strategic intent and in a spirit of learning. So I presume everyone on the call has had relationships of some kind or another, uh, probably different kinds of relationships. But if you reflect on what it takes to actually constitute one, you'll find that it is difference as much as commonality. That uh, uh, unless, as this chart illustrates, there's some interest that you have a res interest I have that you have a resource to satisfy, uh, and that you have an interest that I have a resource to satisfy, there's no basis for an exchange. And I don't mean of a purely instrumental nature. I mean I may be a good listener, and you may need listening to. Uh Brian here again. Uh, we're just going to try and connect back with Marshall. Uh, as you can see, he's creating a picture here of the resources, the interest, and the commitment. Um, just an opportunity to flag again, an opportunity for you to place some questions into the chat box that we'll then be putting to Marshall. And also to remind you, we're now going to run this call. Marshall's agreed to stay on the call uh, till at least uh, quarter past four. If you can't stay for that, the edited um, 
the recording will be made available, but hopefully you can stay on to hear some of the questions live. Uh, in the meantime, Delu, would you like to take us to some music? Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay online. Mr. Marshall is dialing back to the conference. We are back again, I hope. I hope our, we were just at this crucial moment of whether we were going to have a relationship or not. Uh, I think, <laughs> uh, the, the question being, uh, will we commit the time uh, to building the relationship? Uh, because relationships, unlike contracts, are beginnings, not endings. Because as human beings, we learn from each other, we grow with each other, we find new interests, we find new resources. And so commitment to a relationship is commitment to an ongoing uh, pathway uh, to learning, growth, and development in which the relationship itself may become a resource. This is very different than extracting a resource from another person. Oh, I got your signature, I got your money, or the way it sometimes feel when we say, ooh, I just got networked. Uh, it's not like that. It's actually committing the time, energy, and openness to learn about each other enough to determine uh, common ground for working together. So that's, that's uh, a foundation of relational work. But now, so where does it go and, and what do we do with it? And that comes to the next piece, which is uh, the, the, the work of story or narrative, uh, which is, well, what's, the, what's our story? What's my story? What's your story? The significance being that story is how we have learned to access the emotional resources to enable agency in the face of challenge, to enable ourselves to respond as opposed to react to challenge and the uncertain. Uh, and, uh, and, and uh, well, just to illustrate, uh, thinking of it this way, uh, to get to action, there is a motivational side, uh, which is based on our affective mapping of the world, and a strategic side, which is based on our cognitive mapping of the world. A cognitive mapping helps us understand how to do what we want to do. The, the affective mapping helps us understand, helps us know why, why it matters, why we care. And together, they operate together in order to move, move the hands, to get into action. Now, uh, so the first sort of uh, premise here is to understand that values and the whole language of values is the language of emotion because uh, it, it, it is rooted in the value that we assign and experience uh, to different things, people, events, and so forth. Uh, and we also know that there are some kinds of emotions that facilitate a mindful response to challenge and others that inhibit it. Uh, on the one hand, on the left, most of the time we're on autopilot. We, we operate out of habit. Uh, but we may be driving along one day on autopilot and a truck pulls out in front of the car and we better get off autopilot so our brain has evolved a surveillance system that alerts us to that anomaly, that unexpected, that truck, and we experience it as urgency or anxiety. Now, that anxiety is a positive response because it says, you got to look at this differently. Uh, the habit's not going to work here. you got to deal with this in a different way. So the first challenge we face often with leadership is how to create the urgency or perhaps anger, and by that I don't mean rage, I mean outrage, the dissonance between world as it is and world as it ought to be, to provoke enough anxiety to get engagement. Now, the challenge is that our default response to anxiety is a reaction, and it's the reaction of fear. It's the reaction of fight or flight or freeze. Now, Maybe when we were living on the plains millions of years ago, that was a constructive response. Uh, living with other people in community and in culture, it turns out to be a pretty destructive response. And so through culture, we've evolved a means of responding as opposed to reacting 
by mobilizing the emotional resources we need to do that, specifically a capacity for hope in the face of fear, for empathy or solidarity in the face of isolation, and for ICMAD or you can make a difference or self-efficacy in the face of self-doubt. Now, what does this have to do with narrative is that a story is such a moment. Uh, a story moment consists of a character in a plot. It yields a moral. And what makes a plot a plot is not I got up this morning and came to work. It's I got up this morning. I went out where my car was supposed to be. It was gone. There was a grease spot. There was a screeching noise. Well, however uh, absurd or however unpredictable, it is the intervention of the unpredictable in an otherwise predictable course of action that engages us. And because we can empathize with the protagonist of the story, we can feel our heart gets an understanding of what's going on, not just our head. So while we can experience the fear, we can also experience where the character goes to get the courage, to get the hope. In other words, what are the value resources the, the character taps into in order to learn, uh, in order to equip uh, themselves emotionally to be able to respond as opposed to react? And so the moral a story teaches is not a proposition, it's an experience. And stories then are, are powerfully communicate through the creation of experience, uh, the, uh, the uh, experience of values to which we can go for courage and, uh, and uh, hope and possibility. Uh, in our work, we harness the power of story to leadership by learning how to tell a story of self, to use narrative to communicate to others what it is that calls us to leadership, um, to uh, articulate a story of us use narrative to bring alive the values shared by those whom we hope to engage in action, and a story of now in order to communicate the challenge to those values that requires action now. And that's the narrative piece of work that we do along with um, building on relationships. Now, uh, so we've got motivation, we've got these relationships, uh, but we need uh, we need to structure ourselves how we're going to do this this work that we're going to do. How can we organize ourselves? And um, what we've come to the conclusion is that uh, the structure that seems most um, viable and really most important these days, as the old model of the single leader and the market model is the only alternative, prove their inadequacy when it comes to achieving shared purpose. And so our focus is on develop building of leadership teams for which there is a great deal of research in terms of what it takes to make them work, to be bounded, to be real, uh, to have shared norms, to have a governance structure, not complicated stuff, but work we rarely do. And so we start by building a core leadership team uh, and then moving from that team outward um, to engage others uh, so that each team member uh, has their own team to engage others outward and in that way mobilize a constituency. It's a distributed model of leadership. It's one that is not, uh, uh, it's not flaky. Uh, it's clear in that responsibilities are clear, norms are clear, uh, outcomes are clear, but responsibility is collaborative and shared and we can talk more about that later. Next, and, and fourth, the fourth uh, uh, practice is strategizing. Uh, and for my experience, we were always David dealing with Goliath. And so the capacity to strategize creatively, how to turn what you have into what you need to get what you want, was always a central aspect of creativity. And, uh, and it meant uh, a deep understanding of what could be a resource. Uh, now, I, this chart shows here that strategy is motivated just to make the point that um, the challenge of the unexpected that provokes story is also the challenge that provokes strategy. Uh, in other words, we also operate habitually unless something provokes us to have to think about it differently with intentionality and with purpose. So there's kind of a convergence of story and strategy when it comes to exercising individual or collective agency. Um, strategy is intentional, uh, the intentional transformation of resources into outcomes. It's a theory. Uh, it's situated 
in that this is the word derivation of strategy. Strategos was the general uh, of the Greek armies who oversaw the, the, the battle, and the tacticas were the, the soldiers that were deployed. So strategy is a theory of change. Tactics are the actions required to enact it. Uh, and it's a verb in that uh, the work of strategy only begins with our initial plan. Our real capacity as a strategist is our ability to adapt uh, to new challenges and new opportunities uh, as, as we move forward. And it's nested in that uh, we often undertake a goal uh, like the people did in Montgomery, Alabama, boycotting buses, when really what they wanted was to uh, go after the whole system of institutionalized racism, but there was no point of access. The point of access were the buses. And by targeting the buses, then they could move to a, they could develop the capacity to move to a broader assault on segregation, and in that way move to a broader assault on, uh, on the whole uh, system of institutionalized racism. So it's important that we ask ourselves what the relationship is between our immediate objective and the deeper or more structural uh, challenges that we face uh, in creating change. Um, finally, strategy needs to be turned into action to be real. Uh, resources mobilized, resources deployed, and when it comes to volunteer effort and organizing and social movements, uh, the coin of resource mobilization is commitment. Uh, that is understanding uh, that when we ask people for commitments, that we really mean it, and they need to really mean it. Uh, not this little conspiracy of where, I, can you, will you come to my meeting? Oh, I'll try. Oh, well, that's a yes. It's not a yes. It's probably a no. Sometimes we engage into conspiracies like the sociologist Irving Goffman described when someone spills soup on their shirt, and you see it, but you act like you didn't, and they saw it. You saw Hi, Brian here again. Uh, clearly we're still having some difficulty with uh, Marshall's uh, talk and he'll come back just in a moment. Uh, you might want to be thinking about uh, his comments on commitment and uh, how do we mobilise and deploy resources and is commitment really commitment or more superficial than that? Uh, in the meantime, again, think about questions for Marshall. He's agreed to stay on the call. We'll have 15 minutes of questions at the end of the call. So uh, please uh, chat in the chat box. Uh, thanks to uh, David and to Ingrid for their comments to date. But please, uh, please chat some more, and we'll speak to you soon. Thank you, Delu. So I'm going to stop there and go back to this uh, original chart uh, that we first introduced. Um, of the overview of this approach, uh, which is one of working with members of a constituency to turn their resources into the power they need to achieve outcomes through the power of, uh, of relationship building, storytelling, structuring, strategizing, and action conducted as, as, as purpose-driven uh, campaigns. And so let me just stop right there. I guess we have only a few minutes Let's go. Marshall, Brian Robson here. Thank you so much uh, for both the uh, depth of your, uh, your uh, discussion uh, with us today and also for sticking with the technical glitches, uh, showing real resilience uh, and, and hope. And we pass over to Sean Mayer, who's one of our uh, safety fellows, uh, who's going to kick off the questions. Uh, Sean. Uh, hi, Marshall. Just to echo Brian's thanks for his uh, fascinating and uh, really uh, helpful words. Um, we, um, uh, the thing that strikes me as, we, as, as we're listening to what you were saying there is that in healthcare we have a classic power, we have a really pow significant power imbalance and one of the uh, pieces of work that we're involved with here at Healthcare Improvement Scotland is, a pers is developing a more person-centred healthcare system uh, and that's really fundamentally about shifting the balance of power, make, having a more pa equal power relationship. And we recognise that as 
to, to bring this into effect, we need social movement. So it's not only what we're doing in the centre, it's what's happening out there as well. And, and, and many of us on this call today are in statutory organisations and, and bodies which are, uh, if you like, part of the problem perhaps. Uh, so what I was wondering is if you've got any key tips or bits of advice for us on, on how do we go about um, uh, nurturing and supporting social movement. What's, what's our role in, in helping that social movement to, to, to take root? Is it looking outwards, looking for the green shoots, that, that wave that's rising up and then wrapping around that and supporting, having that awareness and flexibility? Because sometimes we feel like we lock ourselves into a particular route and it limits our ability to, to flex in that way and have that awareness. So any... any well, obviously, I don't know the you know the, the the specifics of the context, but let me just suggest uh, two two questions, two ways to to perhaps uh, think about it. And I appreciate the question. Uh, one is, um, you know, uh, people in healing have enormous moral authority. Um, uh, it is a very powerful position from which to make moral claims on the community, on the society, on the system. And I wouldn't ignore that. Uh, I mean, uh, that that's pretty important, um, it, you know, especially when you're dealing with questions of movements and so forth. Self-interest is always sufficient to keep things the way they are. It takes something deeper. It takes a deeper kind of moral energy to actually do the work of trans. Uh, are you still there? Yes. Yep. Okay. And so uh, first is to recognize the power of that resource. Second to think about is within. Um, uh, uh, one of my students is working in the Los Angeles Unified School District, which has got to be one of the most bureaucratic, convoluted, dysfunctional entities in the world. Uh, but she is, uh, she is essentially doing an internal organizing drive among teachers and principals to transform the way in which the schools are being uh, the, the way in which the, the education is being conducted at the school level. It's sort of like a movement within that structure. Now, obviously, that's a challenging and risky business and hard to pull off because it runs in tension with formal authority. But then there's a question of creating spaces within which that kind of energy can be mobilized, whether it's a day of change thing like the NHS uh, did or things on more focused scales. But I wouldn't give up on what can be done internally uh, because in many well the the then the third thing is what you were describing which is to ally with uh, with communities with constituencies constituents out there who are trying to organize with similar goals and purposes um, it's hard to relate to a patient as equal if the when it, it's hard unless the patient also has a source of power I think um, and sort of, so so it seems like achieving what you're describing requires almost that communities be organized to interact with the system. Now, that may not be your role, but it may be the role of others with whom you can work. So I don't know. Those are those are just a few thoughts about it. Thank you very much for that, Marshall. Marshall, you'll be aware that we're recording this call and we're, we've got uh, some comments in from colleagues in New Zealand, some of whom are actually, uh, have stayed up to, uh, to listen to the call. So this is a question from uh, David Grayson, who's the uh, clinical lead of the 20,000 Days campaign. This is a campaign uh, in Middlemore in uh, New Zealand. Uh, looking to give back uh, well and healthy days uh, by anticipatory care, i.e. keeping an eye out for patients that may be sick and stopping them spending time in hospital or indeed getting people out of hospital uh, quicker to give them more of their life back. David's, uh, David's question is that uh, uh, when will we see, a, in his words, a civil, civil rights-like movement overthrow the power of the status quo in healthcare? Do you think that's coming? Do you think the time is now? I, I think we'll see it, David, when you begin to lead it. I mean, and I'm not saying that to put you on the spot, or, but I mean, where is the moral energy going to come from to make that happen? I am struck, I have to say, this, the whole interest in this social movement and this way of organizing around values and collaborative work, I had no idea there was such... A, a constituency of interest within the world of healthcare until Don Berwick got me down to one of his uh, sessions uh, in Florida, and I saw 5,000 people who all 
had the resources, had the commitment, and had the, the, the caring to want to actually do something. And I see it with my students in global health as well as in domestic. I, I think you're sitting on, on in, in a domain that is just aching to make much broader moral and political claims uh, on on the economy, on our politics. And, and the question is, yeah, who steps up? In what way does it happen? Where does it go? I mean, I just, the other thing I'd, I just want to say is that that the old ways of doing things, you know, with this one top-down authority way and then the market as the main other contrast uh, got lots of limits. Um, a lot of this work, this values-based relational work, is about how to do collaborative work. It's how to create agency at an individual and a collective level. And and that's that's central to actually, I would think, good health care is the enhancement of agency by patients, by clinicians, by everyone. And, and uh, so I think this is also an experiment in ways to do that, ways to avoid the, you know, the, the fragmentation and diffusion of market solutions and the old bureaucratic authoritarianism. So I think there's a lot of room for experimentation here and a lot of places where such a movement could initiate, although it feels like it's very powerfully latent right now. Thank you very much for that. And David has uh, chatted in the chat box to say that, okay, he's going to take on Goliath, exclamation mark. Right. So you, you've stimulated him there, uh, Mark. I, I have another question from a... Make, uh, make, sure, make sure he's got uh, a sling and some stones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a sling and some stones. Okay, he's onto that. Uh, Marshall, uh, just another question again from, uh, from New Zealand, from uh, a, d a different David, uh, Dave... Uh, Gala, the clinical lead at Ko Awatea, their uh, Centre for Improvement and Innovation down there. He says that he comes across a number of young and clever people with uh, intelligence, energy and commitment and passion for what they believe, but no obvious or effective route to channel that. Um, have you come across that? And, and if so, uh, could you give them some advice? And just to remind you, Marshall, we have uh, uh, young healthcare professionals in training in nursing dentistry, uh, and medicine on the call with us today? I think the place to begin is the medical schools, the nursing schools. I think the place is there. I think that to challenge the curricula that, that prepare people to be bureaucratic cogs in a, in a medical, uh, you know, a machine uh, is, uh, is not uh, preparation for it. it. It's not the direction things need to go in. Uh, I've just done a little work here with AMSA, a little work with Primary Care Progress, a little work with medical students organizing around family-based uh, family medicine. Uh, my organizing class every year has more and more public health students and MDs, believe it or not, in it. In fact, one of, our, our, one of my former students was nominated by the president for Surgeon General, uh, Vivek Murthy, who unfortunately went down to the Republicans because of his on, uh, his view that uh, uh, guns were a health issue. Uh, but that vision and that energy, I think uh, the first place is the medical schools. I think uh, to take it on right there and demand the kind of curricular reform that's more consistent with this vision of health and health care. I mean, beyond that, uh, it's sort of the domains we've been talking about, you know, uh, whether it's in the hospitals, the health care units within which people operate, or whether it's an alliance with, with citizens' movements or civic movements that are trying to uh, make change as well. So I don't know. I, these, the thing about this, you know, no one would have predicted Tahrir Square before it happened. I think that you make a lot of efforts in a lot of ways to build the capacity, to engage the challenge, to look for opportunities to collaborate with others, uh, and then, uh, you know, the odds that things will take off go up. Thanks for that, Marshall. So that's a message to the dental students, the nursing students, the medical students out there. Demand the curriculum reform. Uh, so it, it, the, time is, uh, the time is now for that. So thanks for that. I have one final uh, comment uh, or question for you, uh, Marshall. Uh, this is from uh, Ingrid from Fife, uh, an area in Scotland. And Ingrid, uh, has uh, your talk today has reminded her of the teachings of 
um, our Chief Medical Officer, Sir Harry Burns, here in Scotland around asset-based approaches rather than deficit-based thinking. It, the asset-based approaches, is that something that chimes with your messages? Is that an approach that you would recognize? Absolutely, because the, the, when, you, you know, when you're dealing with um, so-called powerless communities and people pro, or powerless people, power, people in po powerless positions, when there's so much focus on what isn't there, how do you ever begin or build anything? And it goes back to that initial observation about the Montgomery bus boycott when people realized that their feet were a resource uh, and that the bus company depended on them. It was Gandhi's insight that all systems of power are ultimately interdependent and depend on the cooperation of those whom they exploit as well as those who benefit from them. And so the option to withdraw is always there. The, the, the capacity for agency is always there. And I think focusing on that reality and, and the resources that brings into view then it is an asset-based approach, very much so. Um, and I guess in one other respect, that in the economic world, we tend to look at people as um, you want to do whatever you want to do with as few people as necessary because people are viewed as a cost. Uh, in the organizing world, you want to figure out how to engage as many people as possible because people themselves are the asset. And through engagement and participation in this kind of work, the wealth grows, it doesn't diminish. And so in that sense, it's kind of like a moral resource in contrast with an economic resource. Uh, but I think that thinking of it in terms of assets is, uh, is definitely uh, very much aligned with this way of thinking. Thank you very much for that, Marshall. And your, your comments and your teaching that you've written extensively about in terms of uh, economic resources go down the more you use them, uh, relationship resources go up the more that you use and nurture them. Uh, is something that we would uh, strike a chord here in, in Scotland and I'm sure wider afield. Uh, Marshall, it just falls to me to, to thank you so much for giving of your time today. We are going to make the re recording. We will uh, edit the recording to make sure that it runs smoothly. Um, we're very grateful to you. We're also going to send some links through to some previous uh, recordings and teachings that you've given elsewhere and we'll, we'll make them available to the people on the call. Um, so just on behalf of uh, Healthcare Improvement Scotland, NHS Scotland and our wider, wider international community, it just falls to me to thank you again for your, your time, your commitment, your energy, your resilience and we are delighted that the class of 64-92 uh, had the resilience to, uh, to keep going. You're an inspiration to us all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Sorry about the technical glitches at the beginning that held us up. But I'll look forward to hearing uh, great news from Scotland. Excellent. Thank you very much, Marshall. And if everyone can stay on the call for a moment, we would just like to share with you the uh, details of the, the next call. Um, so just as Lisa gets that slide up for me, uh, we will uh, we'll take a little look at that when it comes up. Um, but in the meantime, I'll remind you uh, that, that uh, we uh, will be uh, sending out um, details of the uh, links to the recording and also uh, we'll be emailing you certificates of attendance uh, with the reflection uh, element on that form for you to reflect on what you've learned. Um, now we, we have uh, the next call uh, is not on screen at the moment but the next call is uh, on the 21st of May uh, between 4 and 5 uh, p.m. Uh, GMT or British Standard Time, British Summer Time. And the speaker on that occasion will be Frank uh, Federico uh, from IHI. Frank is an internationally renowned uh, quality improvement leader and uh, he'll be very engaging uh, and we we'll look forward to joining you, all, uh, you joining us all then. So it just remains for me to say thank you very much uh, for everyone for joining us. Thanks to the team here, to, uh, to Lisa, to Sean, to Jennifer, to Carmen and thank you all for joining with us. Uh, goodbye. Thank you.